Okay. Hi, Thomas. How are you? Hi, Doug. It's good to hear from you, and I'm glad to have to be here. I'm, I thank you for having me on your show today. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm happy to have you here. Uh, you've got a book out called Every When, and I had to look at that twice to make sure it wasn't a typo. Is that actually a real word, or is that kind of a made-up word for the, for the title? Uh, I understand that there is a definition somewhere in, in dictionaries, but I made it up because I wanted to draw attention to a very important fact, and that is that people are able to understand the word everywhere, but nobody has any ability at all to deal with the word every when, because we, human beings, cannot comprehend time in a, in a complete way. But my point of my book is that God sure can, and because God can comprehend time together, present to all time, it makes a huge difference between the way God sees things and the way us humans are limited in how we see things. Um, let's get a definition of God. Is God a person, place, or thing to you? Well, I certainly believe in a personal God, and the uh, evidence from history, from everything in our culture and civilization, is that a God really is personal. But frankly, my book deals with what, as a Christian, I'll call God the Father. That is, God is creator of the universe, as contrasted to God as the redeemer of the universe. So I'm, I'm limiting my book to the things I know about and not going into the territory that I don't know about. Okay, because I've had other people on the show who have described God as a spiritual concept. They have de uh, defined God as love, which is an emotional reaction. Uh, there's all sorts of different definitions. And then in the more traditional Christian faith, God is an actual person. He's been depicted in movies as a man with long gray hair and a beard sitting on a cloud. Uh, we've had all of these different sort of images of God. There's various different opinions about what God actually is or who he is. Well, part of my book is about the fact that images get in the way. We, we are limited. We see time consecutively and unendingly and just keeps going in one direction. That's a limit of human, humans, which is not a limit of God. However, we project our own limitations upon God. And when we make an image, whether it be the uh, guy with a gray beard sitting on a cloud, as in Michelangelo's uh, painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, or uh, whether it be some idol in the jungle of uh, Peru or someplace that Indiana Jones is trying to steal. Any way you try, you limit God by your images. And the important thing is to realize that your image isn't the real thing, that it's an inferior representation, and to be humble before God and not try to box him in. Now that's a very good point. And I think anybody who has traveled around the world has seen particularly the images of Christ. Uh, depending on what country you go, he's depicted as anything from blonde haired and blue eyed to dark haired and dark eyed to black to Middle Eastern looking. You know, there's a wonderful Christmas carol about that. Some, ch some children see him this way, that way, etc. And it's a beautiful Christmas carol, and it reminds us of the inferiority of images and how we're limited. So it's okay to think of God in a limited way as long as you recognize that it's your limitations that are conditioning your thinking, and it's not God's real limitations. So the, the basic premise of your book is the idea that science and religion can be compatible uh, not conflict exactly. with each other. Very yeah. definitely so. Science is God's gift to us. All of science, God created. God created time. He created space. He created the symmetry principles that give us the laws of nature. His creation is so much better than anything we've ever been able to imagine. And these are gifts from God. And there is no conflict between religion and science if you read both the uh, book of nature and the book of scripture correctly. That's hard to do, 
and it's always limitations, but if we can see our way to understanding our own limitations and then step back from them, we can get a better understanding of God. Do you think we had a better, a better understanding of technology and religion as one, as a compatible uh, entities back like a thousand years ago than we do now? It seems to me the more we've advanced as a man technologically, the farther apart religion and technology have become. That is a problem. And I think the image that that is the case is widespread. An awful lot of people assume that science is opposed to religion. I get people asking me saying, what do you believe? I mean, aren't you an atheist? You must be an atheist because you're a scientist. Well, no, but that is a prevailing image in the public. And it's too bad because it's incorrect. When you really study science and get out on the forefront, you're doing basic research, you begin to see by the grandeur and magnificence of science that is pointing directly towards God, the creator of the universe. And that's a magnificent way to see things. But the fact is that not many people in the public are aware of it. Uh, okay, let me uh, hit on a couple of your talking points. And I'll just read them and uh, get your response to it. it. says, how we can trust God more readily by realizing that God is not limited by space and time. That is a really important uh, point. When we think God is limited by space and time, we impose these restraints on him that resemble human beings' restraints. And we don't give God the credit for the power and the superiority that he actually has. We believe certain things about God that are conditioned by our own limitations, and there are mistakes there. We think that God can't do certain things because we can't do them. Um, the wisecrack, I can't be everywhere at once, is a familiar way of saying that uh, our limitations of space and time condition us. But for God to be able to comprehend and be present to me and you in the 21st century at the same time as, I shouldn't say at the same time, that's, that's uh, wrong words there, and still be comp um, present to uh, Moses thousands of years ago, uh, Jesus, St. Paul, St. Thomas in the Middle Ages, people over in Russia, uh, King of England 300 years ago, these things we can't understand because we are human and we're limited, but God doesn't without any problem at all. And if we can understand our limitations, we can allow God to be God and not try to impose upon him the constraints that we're under. Okay, what do you say to a non-believer who asks, if there really is a God, then why does he allow all of the suffering in the world? This is, of course, the problem of the ages, and every uh, philosopher and theologian has had to deal with it for since the dawn of civilization. And I don't claim to have the correct answer because there probably isn't one that's available to humans. But God sees creation in a comprehensive way that we are going somewhere. There's a future ahead of us, and there's a role for us and for God in that future. And the failings, the stumblings, and so forth, uh, the wars, the Black Plague, all kinds of terrible things that have happened over many centuries are part of this grand drama that is leading forward to something more in the future. And if I don't sound like I know what I'm talking about, it's because I don't know what I'm talking about because I haven't <laughs> been to the future yet. Okay. So, but I am taking a position that says be humble, uh, be respectful and let God lead us forward into a better future. Do you think that uh, nuclear annihilation is going to be one of the options in the future as a restart? I mean, I hope not, but it's certainly possible. We have the technology to do it. It's scary to think about. It, it's, you're, you're absolutely right there. It is scary to think about it and we do have the technology. Uh, you ask, do I think it will happen? Uh, my answer there is no, because I think God does guide us. He interacts with people and interacts with civilization. Um, the famous um, uh, 1962 missile crisis between Khrushchev and Kennedy, um, it, I don't know if you remember the line from those days, uh, you know, we're eyeball to eyeball and the other fellow just blinked. Um, 
it came close. But the idea of being reasonable, of being um, understanding and so forth, these are gifts of capabilities that God gives us. And when he does so, people can uh, avoid the worst of possible outcomes. The good outcomes are much more plentiful than the bad outcomes. And I think God's going to see to it that we avoid the bad outcomes. But as you said, it's scary. And um, I get scared sometimes too. I've had other guests on my show who have contended that we are closer now than we were in the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis because of Putin's sort of erratic state of mind. They're talking about tactical nuclear, that if he decided, OK, let me just put a, a small one down in the Ukraine or something, then the retaliatory strike would be it would be set off a chain reaction, be like dominoes, that we couldn't control that once it got going. And, and, and that's very frightening. It is. Um, what you say is very frightening. And I uh, pray and hope too, that it won't happen that uh, people with better sense will prevail. Um, uh, Putin's erratic. Uh, other leaders throughout the, country, the, uh, the, uh, the globe have been erratic at various times and various places. And somehow we've kept the lid on the problems. But uh, there's no question that the availability of nuclear weapons is always dangerous. Yeah. All right. Uh, we've got just about two minutes, and I want to just hit on one more of your talking points. Expanding our human thinking and step up to a higher plane of understanding. This is really an important step that mankind has got to take. Uh, always and everywhere in the past, thinking has been constrained, and it has limited us. The advances in thinking have been wonderful when they come, but they're not very often. Just in terms of the physics that we understand, we think of the uh, uh, experiments of uh, Galileo and others that to enlighten us about the uh, uh, astronomy, and then the contribution of Newton to turn us uh, to provide us with what we call classical mechanics, and more recently that of Einstein. Every one of these upward steps is an elevation of mankind's level of thinking to a higher plane. And we've got to keep going up in that direction more and more. Um, I just gave you some examples from physics, but there are other people who can give you examples from literature, music, uh, government, many different things in which we've stepped up to a higher plane. There was a time only uh, less than 200 years ago where slavery was very common everywhere in the world. And in America, we stepped up to a higher level of thinking and we eliminated slavery, not without pain and grief, but we did eliminate it. Many other countries have continued to have slavery, a few of them even to today. But as uh, civilization steps up to higher planes, things get better. And that's what I'm urging people to do, particularly when it comes to understanding the unity between science and religion. You can see it if you're looking at it from a higher plane. Well, I think on that note is a good one to wrap up on. Uh, thank you so much for coming on this show. Do you have a website that you want to give out? Well, most people buy the book from Amazon, but we do have a website at the organization iTest, which I'm involved with. It goes www.faithscience, run together as one word, dot O-R-G. Okay, faith science, F A I T H science. Yes. Okay. All right. Dot great. org. Not dot com, but dot org. Dot org. Okay. Well, Thomas, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, I know this topic well, thank you, is. Thank you for having me. This topic is huge, and we could have gone on for a long time, but I think we gave a good overview. And again, the book is called Ever When God, Symmetry, and Time.